Hi, everyone. Bacteria are my favorite creatures. <laughs> they are. They colonized my gut a few minutes after I was born. All they do is grow and divide. I like to think of bacteria as computers, wetware. And in fact, today, we've started to understand um, how cells are structured, right down from the components all the way up into networks, very much like computers. And but because most people aren't biochemists, it's usually easier if I describe this in terms of computing. We'll start with this. This is actually the first transistor, 1947. This is what started the whole computer generation. Next slide. We stayed with the mainframe model for about 25 years. Okay. Pretty much stayed the same all the way to the 1970s. And then something really interesting happened we started to get computers all on a single chip. This made them affordable. We started to see people experimenting in their garages with computers. Apple was actually founded in a garage. That's Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. It was the rise of DIY computing. And within a few years, we ended up getting toy computers. They literally, if if you were alive then, you could buy these things at Radio Shack, you could find them in the back of magazines. And what started to happen is we started to market computers to kids. And they learned enough about computers that they would go bug their parents to get one. And a few years later, we got the internet. Massive explosion of creativity. Now moving into biology, in the 1950s, about the same time the transistor was made, we discovered the code of life. Unfortunately, to work with the code of life and to do programming with it, you needed something like this, a lab, a complicated kitchen. It was really slow. To try and write genetic code and move genetic code around, it was like cut and paste, ransom note style. I don't know if you've ever done a ransom note. <laughs> yeah. It takes a long time, scissors and glue. This took me an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> it's gotten really powerful since then, though. We've started to make literally word processors for genetic code that are really fast and efficient. Moreover, we've coupled it to printers. And this has allowed us to build a completely new biotech industry. And this is an example of a company in the Bay Area now that makes biofuels. But more than that, We've moved it down to the kid level. The barriers for doing genetic engineering have fallen away completely. Like, we can now teach it to undergraduates, we can teach it to high school kids. I don't know how low we can push it down. This is the MIT iGEM class of 2009, International Genetically Engineered Machines. These guys are some of the best genetic engineers in the world, and none of them have degrees yet. We had over 1,200 students from 25 countries. And they did projects like moving a couple of genes from red wine into yeast that made resveratrol so that we had cancer-fighting beer. We also ended up with a whole new set. <laughs> yeah. The winning team last year made a whole new array of different marker proteins that could be expressed so you could actually track a metabolic pathway as it turned on. And the local team here from Edmonton, pictured here, made a microfluidic device to allow gene constructs or even genome constructs to be done faster and easier. They won the foundational prize for new technology. It was amazing. And they even used Lego robots to make these gene assemblies. So this is toy biotechnology, but it's powerful. And in fact, it's making the very cover of some of the most powerful journals in the world, and in fact, has been instantiated in something called a biofab at Stanford, which just opened up in January. And this is actually a design, build, test facility using the exact same tools and parts that the students have made, except now it's opening up to academia and other groups.
This is revolutionary. We've never been able to do genetic engineering so fast, so cheap before. Moreover, people like this fellow, Matt Cowell, have taken it even out of the labs and out of the student arena and brought it into the mainstream with an organization called DIY Bio, do-it-yourself biology. This is open source biology. And they're using all the tools of the internet and social web to do it. They're using comics to describe to people how to go and do some of these procedures. You can find videos on YouTube. In fact, there's whole channels now just on scientific stuff. They're hacking hardware. This is a very low-cost PCR machine, a polymerase chain reaction machine for amplifying DNA. They're hacking gel boxes. This is at a, a, a meeting called Outlaw Biology in LA, which was actually really interesting because the FBI was there. <laughs> they learn how to do DNA isolations and run home labs, and you find a level of passion in this community unlike any other. <laughs> It's really, really breathtaking to be part of this. So what we're finding is that biology really is a new technology now for us to apply. And not just the elites, but really anyone that has an interest in this. And this is opening up a whole new evolution. It's really one of the most significant times in biological science that I've, I believe we will ever see. The Woods Hole guys go down to the bottom of the ocean floor and they find these things called black smokers. It's, there's no light down there, incredible pressures, temp and chemical gradients that are, would be absolutely toxic. And they find it teeming with life. This is probably where life started on the planet. Or maybe you have a different view. <laughs> but we're starting to boot up synthetic life forms we're starting to be able to build small bacterial genomes and these DNA printers get better every year with, with at faster than Moore's Law rates. So we don't know how fast this parallel evolution is going to go or what we can make with it. All I know is there are millions of species on this planet and billions of bacteria and viruses and they're all becoming tractable to designers, which means we have to start thinking a little caref more carefully about what we do and how we do it and creating the right culture of innovation for this. And this is what I wanted to kind of drill home. The culture of innovation in life science is going to be massive. And this province, most of its fortunes are based on things that are either alive or things that were once alive and are now buried underground. Mm -hmm. It's opening up in new ways, though. We also have robotics coming to this. This is a company that makes printers that print cells one day we're going to be able to print new hearts. This is a friend of mine, Zach, in New York, who makes 3D printers as well. They cost $1,000. The other one costs $250,000. We're starting to modify these so they can print cells too. People are finding new ways to fund these projects because they're so cheap to do now. This is something called Kickstarter, where you basically just put up a project and people pledge money for it. It's amazing. So what type of a biological world are we going to get? Bamboo bicycles? Already out there. What type of pets are we going to get? <laughs> it's going to get interesting. That's what's going to happen. Fortified foods. This is golden rice. It could actually, it, vitamin A is added. You know, we can literally cure blindness you know, from vitamin deficiency if we can get this rice out into the world. We probably need a new type of GMO standard that doesn't scare people. But the really important thing is that we're starting to move into an era of individualized medicine now, and of one, one person at a time, that is now realistic to consider. Because the cost of doing these technologies is going straight to the floor. Already, I'm part of a group in, in San Francisco called Quantified Self. And all they, they're kind of narcissistic, but what they really, all they want to do is measure their lives in different ways. We have these computers in our pockets now that can record so many different capacities. We can have, we can have devices like this that are little accelerometers that literally track how much you walk each day, how much you're sleeping, how vigorous the exercise is, and chart it all. 
for, 98, for a few hundred dollars, you can go and get your genome sampled. And in a, today, if you want to get a full comprehensive profile, it's, as, it's only $10,000. A decade ago, it was a billion dollars. That's a pretty steep drop in price. <laughs> Moreover, we're starting to realize, and this is happening spontaneously in the social web, that we are all patients, individual. And so this group, started by a friend of mine, Jamie Haywood, literally collects patient experiences one-on-one. -on -one. It's kind of a Facebook for medicine. And people are actually, this is a real-time clinical trial. And they know what's happening with people the minute uh, it happens, as soon as it's recorded. So one of the low-hanging fruits in all of this personalized medicine is cancer. Take a look to your left, at the person sitting beside you. Take a look to the person on your right. Look down at yourself. One of you is going to get cancer in your lifetime. Right now, our diagnostic capabilities are going straight through the roof, and our treatments are all the same. Nuke it from orbit. Surgery, chemotherapy. We have to be able to get more precise treatments. Right now, the researchers are focusing on understanding cancer, but what we're learning is every cancer is different. It's like, how do you understand the stars by looking up at the night sky? At some point, we have to start learning how to focus our therapies. We had penicillin in the 1930s. It was a wonder drug. We didn't have to understand how it worked. We didn't have to understand bacteria. It just killed the right cells selectively. Now, we can't do that with chemicals. Chemicals are too stupid. They're toasters. We need something smarter that can differentiate between a cancer cell's DNA and a normal cell's DNA. Now, drug companies, they work on a different dynamic. First of all, they don't make drugs for one person. They'd have to sell it for several billion dollars. And they try and satisfy a lot of different stakeholders in the process. That's why they shoot for blockbusters. It's like making a blockbuster movie. You try and get a, everyone in the cinema. It's, it's that head of the long tail that Tim told you about. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But it's always expensive to make. It's slow. And in fact, it's so slow now, it takes 10 to 15 years to bring a new drug to market to get it through all these hoops, and billions of dollars. So if you're expecting a cancer breakthrough tomorrow, it ain't going to come. It's not in the pipe yet. In fact, the stuff coming out of the pipe only went in before there was a genome sequence. So these companies are really dinosaurs. They're dying. Right now, they're just mating. It's called <laughs> merger and acquisition. <laughs> and it's leaving people like Krista, you know, scarred for life. So, I used to work for these big drug companies. They're not bad people. They're just stuck with a really bad system. So I thought, how do we go and change that? And the only thing I could figure out is, we have to do it ourselves. We have to be able to build our own system. Right now, we have all these researchers that do amazing work understanding cancer, and they have no path to the clinic except through about 30 global pharmaceutical companies that don't share their values. So I created a little company here in Edmonton. It's the coolest company in the world <laughs> when it comes to cancer, because it's a co-op. It's people helping themselves. We use those same technologies that I told you about, which are getting cheaper every year. This is the plan. Right now, we're just going out and getting members. Because every day that we wait, these technologies get cheaper and more powerful, and every member we add brings passion, a voice, a skill set. I own one share. Like Mountain Equipment Co-op, you buy one share, and that's it. You become a member. Let me just walk you through this in a couple of minutes. This is a system that we can do today. There is no technological barrier for someone walking up 
and getting analyzed with some of the most powerful genomic tools in the world, full sequencing of their DNA, which will cost as little as $100 three years from now. Using a design, build, test fab like the one that just booted up at Stanford, and there's going to be a lot of these around the world, we're going to be able to make a drug and test it right on an individual's cancer. Now, we won't know if it'll work on every cancer because we're not going to ever do a clinical trial on that. We're just going to be able to hand that person a tube with a therapeutic that's been made with these same genetic technologies and proven to work on their cancer and their cancer alone, and they can do what they want with it. We're not going to sell it to them. It's open source. We're not going to profit from it. We, all the data that we collect will just go into the system for designing the next one. It's totally transparent. It's therapeutic development as a service. And I believe that in five years of starting this process up, your cell phone plan will cost more. Because your cell phone does not replicate yet. <laughs> so we're the first drug company that will never sell drugs. I like that. <laughs> Our entire focus is just on fast. Do it fast. You need this stuff. It's like antibiotics. That's all it is. It's just better antibiotics for cancer. Effective, because damn it, you want it to be effective. And safe, well, that's a risk-benefit analysis you're going to have to do for yourself. And you know, depending on your cancer and the stage and your other treatment options, I can't advise you on that. No one can. That's your choice. This summer, we're going to start looking for the first people that want to be their self-guinea pigs. It's a massive experiment. No idea where it's going to go. But I think we're going to be able to connect some of the most amazing people in the world to this project. And you know, that just made all the years in biotech worthwhile. Just to kind of close on this, life science is going to be a massive economic driver. Cancer is just the low-hanging fruit. We're already seeing it come into biofuels. Anything we make with a chemical today is going to become biochemical. This is a living world. We are going to start making living things. I can see fields of chairs being grown in the future. That's pretty cool. We have to do it because otherwise we poison ourselves. We die. All this carbon economy, when you grow something, it fixes carbon from the air and it puts it into a solid form, like a chair. As we start to move to biomanufacturing, the CO2 problem goes away. The world gets a lot greener. And we don't have scarcity, because you just plant it. But this is going to be a grassroots movement. We're not going to be able to do this top down. We have to focus on community. And with that, I'll thank the co-op members that I currently have. Hopefully, we'll get some more and the organizations that are making personal genomics and this technology of synthetic genomics real and possible. Thank you. <laughs>